Welcome back to Pale Cacexia. Why does the mausoleum keep beckoning Essa in some way? Is it because she might have a key for the mausoleum in which she picked up at the beginning of this game? Only time will tell. Only time will tell. How long has she been here now, exactly? It felt like years, somehow. Perhaps it was because Sina had welcomed her so warmly, without any judgment or expectations, even though she called us Shadow at the very start, or Hollow. Sina understood her better than anyone else, even though they'd known each other only a short time. And she never needed anything from Essa, only her company and support. Sina. Where was she? She'd gone upstairs a little while ago to fetch something, but it seems strange that she was taking this long. Indeed it was. Is she researching something then? Lost in her own thoughts, Essa hadn't noticed how much time had passed. And fetching her seat, she shot a glance towards the stairwell. It was foolish to get so worried like this. Sina had just gotten distracted by something upstairs. Nothing else. No burglars or anything like that. But it couldn't hurt to go check on her. Could it? Once she made sure that Cena was perfectly fine, Essa could slink back down to wait again. That was all she needed to do. But time doesn't work like that. You may need to go in and jump to the rescue before it is too late. Before all is lost. Managing to convince herself it was the right decision, Essa crept upstairs. A strange feeling of guilt came over her, as if she was doing something terrible by doubting her friend, even though it didn't make any rational sense. But we got in here, but that guilt only grew more intense as she approached Cena's bedroom, drawn to the flicker of light from beneath the door. I can't really stand this anymore. I wish you were here, Papa. You could handle things a lot better than I can. Sulking. Sitting on the edge of her bed, Cena heaved a huge sigh, her gaze wistfully trained up towards the ceiling. Confused, Essa stepped closer, peering through the cracked door at her. These floorboards are quite creaky. It's... it's just... She's just so difficult all the time. She doesn't know how to cook or clean, and I'm running out of stored food with all these meals for two. And she never speaks. How could I deal with- Whoa! Is she talking about us? Who's so boring? She froze. Seen as frustrated, distraught words echoed hollowly in her ears, sinking to her chest like a knife. I really wish she would leave. I'd rather just have you, Papa. I was so much happier the way things were before. What should I do? I don't even want to go back downstairs to her. <sighs> Sina's true colours are coming out. I thought she was too friendly. She sighed again, kicking her feet lightly in the air, before leaning back on the, the bed with a soft groan. Hmm. Essa stared at her for a moment longer, completely stunned. She couldn't believe what she was hearing, and yet, in a way, she had always wondered if Sina's true feelings were like this. It wasn't like she could blame her. She never deserved Cena's kindness and hospitality to begin with. You deserve those, minus the lies in which Cena's had all along. And if Cena would be happier without her, it would be best to just get out of the way. Hmm. So then, we are now on foot outside. She barely felt the chilly night air as it enveloped her body. Instead, a numbness spread through her dulling even the sensation of the ground beneath her feet. It took a moment to even realise that she'd started moving, her legs carrying her somewhere on their own accord. It didn't really matter, as long as she was leaving that place forever, a place she never should have entered to begin with. Aimless and without any focused thought, Essa wandered across the dark clearing. On the surface, she seemed to be in a hypnotic trance, but the truth was slightly different. Letting go of any responsibility, any sense of self-preservation or fear, she allowed her body to stumble wherever it wished. She was rewarded with a pleasant, weightless feeling, freed from all her thoughts and anxiety. 
a ghostly trance, devoid of any purpose, only following the invisible current that carried, al ca carried her along. In that moment, Essa realized that she had become truly, completely, hopelessly powerless and she welcomed the relief of her burden with a grateful sigh. That's not a good thing to embrace, the thing of hopelessness. So here we are at the cemetery. After several minutes, or hours, perhaps, a small sea of grey headstones greeted Essa from the dark. As she drifted past them, she felt none of the uneasiness that had gripped her before. Instead, it almost seemed like she was returning home, to somewhere she belonged back to the embrace of familiar friends. They beckoned her forward, drawing her in closer and closer, leading her towards the sole structure that rose among the trees and the mausoleum. And then, two stone doors were gazing back at her. At first, a dark confusion gripped Essa. Why? What was she doing here? Hadn't, been, hadn't there been something dangerous about this place? But as those thoughts welled in her mind, something holy, something a beautiful, longing warmth reached out for her, something that wanted her, wanted to protect her, arms that she could fall back into. All she had to do was follow them. And what rose there? The doors drifted open for her, revealing a dark passage into the mausoleum. So it only opens to certain people. And yet with that golden light still calling out so sweetly, her first tingle of fear quickly dissipated into the nothingness. Once she was inside, Essa heard the doors gently close behind her again. But instead of unnerving her, the thought only brought her more comfort. Now there would be no temptation to return, no going back to such a wrong place. And what is inside this place? The dark secrets that lie within. She followed the angelic summons deeper, heading down through a maze of peacefully sleeping bodies. The further she went, the more a sense of impending relief swallowed her before her, promising deliverance from the pain she hadn't even recognized before. She was so helpless now, and any, com and, and any complete surrender could wash all of her suffering away. More angelic light, it would seem. So close. So close to releasing her grasp on everything. So close to the golden light that awaited her right around the corner. Waiting to relieve her of that last bitter hope that anchored her in grief. She would be free. But. What else lies within she would be free? Essa? Essa? Essa, please, wake up! Essa? Hmm? She jerked upright, drawing in a choked gasp. Sweat poured in her shirt and dripped from her forehead onto her. So that was a nightmare. So it wasn't her true intentions? Essa. Hmm, to her surprise, Cena threw herself forward in a sudden hug, not seeming to mind that Essa was all but drenched. Those small arms clung tightly around her neck, as she could feel Cena giving her a reassuring squeeze. But what happened? You must have been having a horrible nightmare. I heard you crying out from upstairs, and I came down to see you shuddering here. So, what was the part which was a nightmare, and which was the part that was true? I think that the wandering around was the nightmare, but the feeling is that Cena interjected were true you've thrown off all the blankets but you were soaked in sweat i thought you had a fever as the shock of her dream faded a sense of sheepishness overtook her relief from waking up i'm sorry i made you worry it was only a bad dream i i'm not sick for whatever reason she found herself hesitating as she reassured cena the medicine since she'd started taking it, her sleep was rarely peaceful. Although she had never awoken in such a state before, that is a thing. Essa, do you want to sleep upstairs with me? No! Uh, not after what you felt about us. What? The bed I use is really big, so there's plenty of room. But 
You might feel less scared if you had someone else nearby. Maybe you're afraid when you fall asleep, all alone in this dark room. Hmm, a deep concern shone in Cena's eyes, but something else seemed present in her anxious words. Something that almost sounded like guilt, but Esther had no idea why she would possibly feel guilty. You should know, only if having me around wouldn't bother you. I think I'd probably toss and turn in my sleep all the time. Oh, I'm <laughs> you have a lot of nightmares. What do you mean? Hmm, I'm not your property. Well, you don't need to worry about me. I yeah, I think everyone says that. I need to comfort others. I only heard you because I woke up to drink some water. Come, let's go upstairs. I'll give you another Papa's shirt. You shouldn't stay in that one. It's so damp. Is that what you truly feel, Essa? Taking Essa's hand, Cena. So, is that what Cena truly feels? Cena later out of the living room, started up her usual stream of eerie chatter. In the wake of her unnerving dream, it was soothing to hear Cena's bubbling words. They helped to block out the lingering echo of that cold, harsh rejection still resonating in Essa's mind, even if they couldn't completely erase it. What did the nightmare project to you, Essa? And I think you should share that to Cena. As they reached the bedroom, Cena gave her another of Isaiah's black shirts and left to go fold the sofa blankets while Essa changed. A few minutes later, the two girls were sleepily crawling onto the soft bed, eager to escape from the cold night air. Unlike the sofa, there was plenty of room to be had, and Essa gratefully stretched out her beneath the sheets. Good night, Essa. If you have another bad dream, I'll be here. Just wake me up, all right. Okay, maybe you hear us before we have the chance to wake you up, all right. Sleep well, Cena. You too. With that, they both fell silent. I wonder what would happen if, um, Cena didn't wake Essa up from that nightmare. I don't think she would have escaped that nightmare until it was actually over. Cena shifted a few times, then let out a contented exhale before growing still. It wasn't long before Essa had or heard her breathing settle into a slow, steady rhythm, signaling that she'd already fallen asleep. Roaring over onto her back, Essa exhaled a grim, quiet sigh. Certainly, this bed was far cozier than the couch, thanks to both a comfortable mattress and Cena's reassuring presence nearby. But despite Essa's deep tiredness, her mind refused to let her sleep again so easily. She lay awake in silence, staring into space with her eyes half open, repeating the vivid events of her dream. Cena. The memory of her words haunted Essa. As full as it was, she couldn't help but wonder if her nightmare mirrored reality. Perhaps there was some semblance of truth, even if the real Cena would never be so blunt about her feelings. In front of you, that is. She might resent Essa, but not admit it to herself consciously. Maybe she secretly hoped Essa would leave, and was just too embarrassed to tell her directly. Because of how kind Cena was, it was impossible to know she was just masking her unhappiness for Etta's sake. What confused her most, though, was the mausoleum. Why had she been drawn to it like that? And it wasn't the first time. It was the third time. Second time in reality, but one time in the dream slash nightmare. In the real world, the place unnerved her, and she didn't even want to get close to it. But in the dream, he had called out to her so beautifully, promising freedom for a pain she didn't even realise she had. Something else puzzled her too. Cena said she cried out in her sleep, but Essa couldn't remember any sharp fear in the dream. There had been nothing that frightened or attacked her. What made it odd that she awoken in a cold sweat? If anything, the last part of her dream was almost pleasant. I wonder if she purposely put water on our back so it imitated that we were sweating. Perhaps she really had suffered a brief fever, an unknown side effect of a medicine. I don't think so. Or else her, her subconsciousness were hide subconscious was hiding something from her waking self. The flaying about could be true, but the cold sweat, nah. As she emerged from her brooding force, Esther suddenly noticed a weight on her arm. Startled, she glanced downward, 
Her eyes swiftly widened where she saw. Oh dear. Oh dearie dear. Cena had curled up against her clutching ass like an oversized stuffed animal. We're not a used to. F you're not a used thing that you can just use at any given time like your cat. Cena had curled up against her, clutching her like an oversized stuffed animal. She seemed fast asleep. Her movements must have been unconscious. <laughs> a warm sensation bloomed to her chest. Cena looked so small, so innocent, so calm compared to her normal self. As sure as she was, she seemed as defenseless as, as a small kitten in the arms of sleep. She trusted Esther enough to let all of her guard fall to the wayside, utterly at peace while next to her friend. It stirred in Esther a longing to protect the small kitten, no matter what cost. Do you realize what she said to you in your... I don't think it was a nightmare, that part. I think the part going to the mausoleum was a nightmare, but not the actual... Um, words that she said because remember you went upstairs first so I think the transition between the looking at that scene and then going outside was the transition between sleep and this point I think the words put you in a sweat but then for the nightmares will continue to give you the sweat her arm was bent at a slightly uncomfortable angle but she didn't dare move not while she was sleeping so soundly Soon she hardly noticed it at all, her thoughts fading away into pleasant nothingness until an untroubled sleep finally drifted over her. So we didn't get to see a, uh, a past flashback of Vizaya then. As much as I love it, I wish the sun wasn't so bright today. Hmm. When she heard Sino murmuring softly to herself, Essa turned to face the other girl. They were out gathering flowers in a warm afternoon, with most of the chores already behind them. Since that morning, though, Sin had been acting a little less energetic than usual. I wonder why that is the case. Are you alright, Sina? You're not ill, are you? Ill? Oh no, I'm not ill. It's only just a headache. I get them sometimes, but I don't know why. A common symptom, but they pass. Cena glanced downward as she mumbled her reply, as her confessing her pain made her feel embarrassed. You should go lie down, then. I can take care of the cemetery. No, I really don't need to. I can keep working. You shouldn't have to do it alone. It's fine, Cena. There's not much left. Rest, and the headache will go away sooner. Nah, she groaned softly in protest, pursuing her lips together for a moment. Alright, I will, but only because you're so stubborn about it, Esther. I'll see you inside soon, alright? Please don't work too hard. That's slightly hypocritical advice coming from you, isn't it? <laughs> hypocritical, I mean. Not hyper. They're two opposite things. Esther, did I punch you in your sleep or something? You're ruthless today. I have to be ruthless to make you take care of yourself. <laughs> well, that's not something I ever expected to hear. And, pursing her lips in a pout, Sino prodded her finger playfully against Esther's side, and the two of them broke into light giggling. <laughs> Nothing like a bit of bad to wake you up and also soothe their headache. But here, when the other girl turned and left for the manor, Esther felt relieved in a way. Recently, Sino had been looking after her so much, it almost made her uncomfortable. She jumped at any opportunity she had to even slightly repay the favour. Though it never seemed like enough. Anything to keep that dream from becoming reality, she thought grimly. But unfortunately, sometimes what we see in the fictional world can sometimes come to pass in the real world. Not the actual events, but the psychological implications of what those events transpired as. Clutching a basket of flowers in one hand and her broom in the other, Essa made her way along the path Cena had shown her. Despite her poor sleep, she felt curiously energized today. Speaking was less challenging, and her body responded to her wishes more willingly than normal, like a weight was temporarily lifted from her shoulders. She'd truly come to enjoy working outside, especially in days like these, days when the forest felt like it accepted her, somehow. But despite her newfound comfort, there was still one place that sent an uncontrollable shiver down her spine as soon as she entered it. The cemetery. 
No matter how many times she visited this place with Cena, she could never shake the odd, unsettling sensation it gave her. It was all in her head, most likely. If it's just this place, then is there something ethereal about it? After all, Cena didn't seem to feel the same atmosphere. If her easy smiles were anything to go by, maybe she's just choosing not to admit her uncomfortable feelings. Maybe she's just been here so many times that the haunty feelings are just completely numbed her now. Or perhaps she's just choosing to hide it. But even more strangely, Esther felt an indescribable pull towards this place, almost as if something was waiting for her. Something she didn't know, something she didn't want to know, but was being slowly led to uncover. A secret, deeply buried. One that was surely better off that way. Perhaps there's a voice beckoning her to go there to set it free somehow. As she finished tending to the last of the graves, Esther's gaze finally drifted towards the single, lonesome spot that she had avoided. The grim shape of the mausoleum, its doors tightly shut like a stone maw. There was no reason to bother with it. It's locked, Cena had said. I don't think I'll ever find the key. 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 Despite her attempts at rationalizing with herself, a powerful urge swept over Esther. She cautiously approached the stone structure, half expecting a repeat of her dream somehow. Unlike before though, the door seemed tightly shut, and when she tugged at one of the handles to no avail, it confirmed her suspicions. In between the ornate slabs of stone, Essa noticed a small, almost imperceptible slot, the keyhole no doubt, and a key of matching size would be incredibly difficult to find if it truly was lost somewhere. Have you come to a sudden realization? Aha! Rise that thought crossed her mind, Essa froze! Impossible! There was simply no chance! The likelihood of such a coincidence was practically zero! Even though she fully understood it, she still couldn't control the sudden, intense desire to try. Slowly, hesitantly, her hand drifted downward, feeling for her skirt pocket. Sure enough, a small bump still rested there. It was the key that you picked up at the start of the game. The key would fit perfectly. She knew before she even tried it, she could feel the pull between them somehow. And sure enough, as soon as she slid it into the lock, the door echoed with a low, ominous click. <laughs> as she, if she'd been burned, as I jerked her hand back. <laughs> it took her a moment to realize that she was trembling uncontrollably. Strangely enough, she didn't understand why. It was like an irresistible lure pulled her towards the mausoleum. And at the same time, every fiber of her body screamed at her to run away. What are you going to do? For now, the latter instinct won out. Yeah. Hasty locking the doors again, she pushed the key back into her skirt. She could investigate the interior some other time, and preferably while not alone. But deep down, Esther had an overpowering feeling that sooner or later, something would bring her back here. Hmm. Something would bring her back there. Something that would allow you to have no choice. Leaving the cemetery behind, she finished up the remaining chores in a distant murking haze of thought. Her dream, the mausoleum, the key. The key in particular disturbed her greatly. It almost certainly belonged to Isaiah, which meant it had likely fallen out of his pocket in the woods. But something that big, you can't just notice it falling out of your pocket. <laughs> oh, that's daft. I have a cousin that dropped her keys and card and stuff in a, in a wallet in, in a shop somewhere one time when she was with my mom and she didn't even notice that oh let me just casually drop my stuff not purposely but it's like absent-mindedly but why why would he be carrying something so specific with him especially such a distant away from the manor had he been out on a walk or was he running away Everything about it seemed so strange, including the remarkable coincidence that she'd stumbled upon such a tiny thing. It was almost as if she had been meant to find the key. It was prophesied! Or as if it wanted to be found.
Essa returned to the manor as the afternoon began, steadily waning into evening. Her unsettling discovery made her want to head straight for the study, in the hope that she could find something about the mausoleum in Isaiah's writings. Hmm. And here is the room again. There she started to press by the slightly open bedroom door. A strange hesitation suddenly forced her to stop. Her dream. Those words of loathing that Cena spoke. The idea of hearing them again made S uncontrollably stutter, shudder. It took her all of her willpower to force herself closer to the door, to lean forward and peek inside. And in there... In there, Cena's small form was curled up peacefully atop the bed sheets, fast asleep. She looked as innocent as any human could possibly be, her gentle expression completely different from that cold look Essa had witnessed in her nightmare. Hmm, of course she did. It was only a dream. Just a lingering dream. This is a dark fantasy gothic horror game. There's nothing that is not just a dream! Sighing quietly, Essa pulled back from the door. She'd never been so paranoid about something before. It wasn't a welcome change, that much she could say for certain. Inside the study, the sun's warm rays leaked in sheepishly through the window, though they were already beginning to reside. It was still bright enough to read without a candle, so Essa hurried over to an untouched shelf, beginning to quickly leaf through the various loose papers. She scanned each page for a mention of a mausoleum before setting it aside, trying to keep herself more focused on her topic of interest. However, almost everything she saw was related to the study of magic, charms, hexes, talismans, and many other clearly non-scientific things. Eek! Eek indeed! Before long, the sun had fully resided into darkness, and she had little choice but to light the candles in order to keep reading. Then as her eyes flickered across another unrelated journal entry, something about it caught her attention. It was unmistakably Isaiah's handwriting, but it seemed even shakier and more chaotic than before. So is it that the more chaotic the handwriting, the closer to the present we are? Or is it the further away from the present, the more chaotic they are? But... That wouldn't make sense if it was the one where it would be going further into the past rather than here, because what would be causing it? As usual, she couldn't contain her curiosity. Rising up to the light, she peered at the erratic words, trying to purse his unstable pensmanship. Hmm. I wonder how Essa and Isaiah would have gotten along if they ever met. Once corrupted by the evils of society, there is no redemption for a faltering spirit. Simple pleasures turn to bitter cynicism, childlike wonder shifts into suspicion, and a love for life becomes a need for relief, an outlet to escape the dread of facing another day. But in my daughter's unending joy, I have rediscovered a meaning for my own existence, a redemption from all of those poisonous thoughts and feelings. My sole wish is that her smile never darkens and remains forever unbroken by worldly sorrows and disillusionment. She will be fully independent, completely removed from the mundane evils of society. No one shall find her here, and she shall not go to them. Hmm, that part is wrong, because someone else came to her. Alas, I know there's only a matter of time before someone ventures into these woods, despite their ill repetition. For that reason, I have redoubled my efforts to protect this place, as I know my days are swiftly running out. So this is definitely more into the present. Though my recent research of the arcane has yielded little, I have stumbled upon an ancient charm of warding that should serve me well. In order for a living human to find the house, they must either share my blood or be carrying one of my possessions. The key! The key is what it was! Any common thing will do, as long as it is attached to a memory of mine. If I remained in contact with Jermariah and ever asked him to visit, I would, uh, I would have only needed to send him a letter with a trinket attached. But now, any passerby would subconsciously keep their distance from the ward's border so subtly that they will surely would never notice it, even if they are actively seeking the manor. 
Ah, so in a way, it was like the house was in its own time-space continuum. Like I said at the very beginning of the game, it was drifting about in time and space. But it's just different because it's not by any sort of spatial beckonings or deities as such. But it's more like by wards, by the unseeable. In this way, I will keep the two of us safe in our isolation. You know what, that's the best way to escape this virus that we're having in the world right now it's just escape yourself when you know you've been tested negative just escape to an island or somewhere else where time and space is just completely separated even when i'm gone there's no risk of cena ever being found and lured away by an intruder this security brings me some comfort in my last remaining days of lucid thought i love her so very very dearly my cena i am distinctly painfully aware that I do not deserve her. I have become little more than a bitter shell, something that once harboured a relentless investment in the world around him, but no longer. No matter how much I attempt to change my ways, I feel as if I am made of stone, unable to alter or improve myself without crumbling to useless pieces. They do say that if a sword is broken, it can still cut. Because the broken edges of it can still cut. That is why I would do anything, everything, to keep her from becoming what I am. If she never tastes the scorn of a life beyond nature's boundaries, then she would have been spared from the spiritual death it harbors. She will always retain her innocence, her childlike love for all she sees, and no one may ever shatter the fragile beauty her world yet retains. If she comes to despise me for keeping her here, then so be it. It pains me to know that she does not see the truth behind my warnings. But one day, I hope she will overcome. So, well, she will come to understand how I only act is out of love, selfish though it may be. Love is a selfish thing, because you want to know that that one person is always happy. Her gaze finally lifted from the rambling words. It took her a moment to fully process what she'd read, connecting it to the very same coincidence she'd been dwelling on earlier. Hmm. The key. That was the item itself that was connected to Isaiah. Murmuring aloud in astonishment, she unconsciously reached down for the small lump in her pocket. Did his warding charm actually work? Was that why, despite the rumors of someone living in the forest, nobody had ever discovered the manor before? ever discovered and if she ev and if she had never stumbled upon Isaiah's key would she have passed right by this place avoiding it without ever noticing fate prophesized but Isaiah had never wanted anyone else to come here if he'd known Esther was living with his daughter he would have been furious at both of them a sharp pain of guilt cut through her despite the fact that she didn't agree with his outlook Surely it wasn't fair for him to keep Cena isolated, and yet, the idea of shattering Isaiah's dying wishes filled her with a deep sadness. In a way, she almost felt like she knew him. Though all his intimate writings and Cena's descriptions, she'd come to understand at least a part of him, enough to feel his bitterness and sorrow. To think that he would have hated Essa if he saw her now, taking over his place at the manor, Sharing her life and experiences with Cena, he would have sought to tear them apart. And a sharp pain at that moment, a horrible dizziness crushed into Essa, sending the world into a blurry spiral. She could hear her ears ringing. For a moment, it felt like she was about to lose consciousness completely. But. Stumbling out into the hallway, she made her way unsteadily towards the bedroom, leaning against the wall for support. And Cena was gone. It didn't surprise her, but seeing an empty room made her a strange panic flutter in her chest. Parva wanted to call her out, but... No, she was fine. This had to be only a short dizzy spell. But the pain is still there. It wasn't time to take her medicine yet. Still too early. And yet she felt so weak 
as if either she or the world would come crumbly down at any moment. If she lied down for a few minutes, maybe also maybe the awful sensation would leave her. She just wants it to leave. But there Es Essa 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 Sina's voice suddenly permeated the ringing in her ears. Turned around, she saw a small girl watching her with obvious worry and confusion in her eyes. Essa? Are you alright? Did you have a fever? She quickly reached up, up to her, her palm and Essa's forehead, trying to feel her temperature. No, I'm fine. Just a little dizzy. Oddly enough, while she spoke those words, the sensation abruptly vanished. She still felt slightly off balance, but the ringing had stopped completely. Dizzy? Oh dear. You haven't eaten since this morning, have you? I wonder if that's it. You really don't eat nearly enough, Essa. <sighs> Cena reached out to take her hand, pulling her gently back towards the hallway. Why don't we go start on dinner? A meal and some hot tea will make you feel better. I'm sure of it. Alright. I'm sorry for making you worry. Yes. Why would you be sorry? It's not like it's your fault. It's our body's fault. It's hard looking after oneself, believe me. I should know. Hmm. That's why it's so nice to have someone else around. What is your motive, Cena, for being so nice to us? It's just because there's some other person in the house now. As happy as it made Esther to hear Cena's reformination. A flicker of guilt bit into her stomach again. It refused to fade so easily this time, following her as they descended the stairs to the kitchen. Even when they sat down for their meal, she felt distracted, unable to enjoy their relaxing time together as much as usual. Perhaps you need to offload what you've learnt from that dream and also from that letter. After a while, Cena's presence helped diminish the unpleasant thoughts that haunted Essa. She felt a little more reassured whenever their, her friend fussed over her, if only because it was a reminder that Cena truly cared, or putting on a facade that she truly cared. Making the other girl laugh and smile ease her worries too, especially since it seemed like the opposite of what Zaya had feared would happen. But as they returned to the parlour, warming themselves by the fire like always, a nagging thought found its way to the forefront of Essa's mind. She had to tell Cena about the mausoleum. It didn't feel right to keep the key a secret. Besides, maybe Cena knew something else useful about it, like a clue as to why Zaya had been carrying the key with him. Hmm. Could I ask you something, Cena? Of course, you don't need to ask if you can ask. Hmm. When she saw Essa's solemn expression, however, the smile soon faded from her features. About the mausoleum. Have you ever been inside it? The mausoleum? No, I haven't. Why did she take so long to answer? She shook her head somberly, looking slightly unnerved. I think I told you before, but I don't have the key. Hmm. I found it. I have the mausoleum key. Gasping audibly, Senior stared at her in shock. Y you found it? But how? Where? I searched all over the manor and all through the grounds, even the woods outside. Did Papa hide it somewhere? Pulling out the key to offer it to Senior, she started to explain what had happened, how she'd found it far away in the woods, her sudden realization it was for the mausoleum, and her discovery of Isaiah's protective wall around the manor. She was too embarrassed to mention her dream, which in truth was the only reason why she tried the key in the first place. Otherwise, it likely would have slipped her mind completely. Once S had finished speaking, Cena set in thoughtful silence for a moment. Slowly, hesitantly, she reached out to take the tiny key, curling her fingers around it so lightly that she seemed to be afraid it'd burn her. I'd forgotten about it until now, but I remember Papa mentioning something about a ward. That wasn't long before he vanished. She trailed off, holding the key tightly against her chest. 
Elsa put a gentle hand on her shoulder. In response, Cena smiled at her gracefully. Gratefully, still a little visibly shaken, but she seemed to recover herself quickly. Papa didn't want me to never go into a mausoleum, especially not with him. He probably carried a key around so I couldn't find it. But he always refused to tell me why I couldn't go inside. It was so frustrating. Hmm. Again, her mind unwittingly flashed back to her dream, and a sense of foreboding crawled over her, but she did her best to force it away and ignore it. Maybe we could take a look at this together sometime. If it seems safe, I mean, I wouldn't want to go too deep inside if it's falling apart, of course. I'd like to see it. I don't know why, but it feels... It feels important, somehow. It's good, to I, it's good if I pace myself with the dialogue. Well then, maybe it is important. It's worth believing in your instincts. They know a lot more than we do, I think. Okay, her smile slowly began to brighten again, and she reached up to poke the tip of Essa's nose te teasingly. Ow! Yep, what do you mean now? I barely even touched your nose! You don't know your own strength. My whole face went numb. <laughs> yes, sir. Unable to contain herself at Cena's pouting, Essa broke into stifled laughter. Cena joined him before long, they fell into a comfortable, easy chatter while carrying up on the couch. Again. At her friend's behest, Esther shared some stories about her time at the academy and of the days back before she contracted the pale. Though her thoughts still occasionally drifted back to the mausoleum, sharing her findings with Cena had lifted a huge burden from her shoulders in much needed relief. Cena's interest in everything she said helped distract her too. She never met anyone who held such an interest in what she had to say. It fascinated how her, sorry, it fascinated her how the most mundane things, laws, customs, crimes, politics, enruptured the other, the other girls so much. The only views she acquired of the world had come from Isaiah and the various books of fiction and non-fiction he'd given her to read. It was a very limited, carefully curated selection of knowledge, focused mostly on the natural world, and even her fictional stories were so fantastical that they barely touched on any aspects of modern society. Essa found it inve sorry, interesting, I'd say investing there, too. How explain her own culture aloud made it sound so odd and contrived. There were countless visual laws and customs. Vestigal, however you want to pronounce that word, that had no place anymore, and yet most people still treated them as indispensable. In a way, Essa could understand Isaiah's scorn of civilized society, falling into parts of traditional thought never questioned them leading one into a cycle of misery without ever fully understanding it. It really was frustrating, as Cena, spared as she was from such thoughts, seemed so blissfully beyond all of it. Perhaps that explains why Essence's guilt refused to be rationalized away. Like Isaiah, she only wanted what was best for her friend. The idea that she was somehow contaminating Cena's mind was outside influences made her so with outside influences, made her feel deeply uncertain, even if the other girls seemed so eager to learn about the world outside her own. Finally, as the fire began to die down, the pair returned upstairs to their room. As Cena put on her nightgown, Esther quickly injected herself with her nightly medicine, gritting her teeth to finish as quickly as possible. Luckily, it seemed easier than normal today, maybe because another presence was nearby. Maybe because of their presence we can feel a little bit more at ease. After both of them had changed into their more comfortable nightwear, they crawled underneath sorry, under the covers before the chill could seep into their bones. This time Cena was still awake when she snuggled up to Essa, dropping an arm across her wrist. <laughs> she was conscious then. Ah, so sleepy. Good night, Essa. Sleep well, Cena. A peaceful, warm silence draped over them as they, after they exchanged words, replaced by the calm rhythm of their breathing. 
before long Esther found her consciousness easily ebbing away. It was for Jessica's sleep. She had fallen ever for she had ever fallen into her. okay. In the last moments of current force, she found herself deeply contently grateful for it. Damn it all. This is an illusion. And then, lulled off by the warmth of Cena's arms and the coziness of a soft pillow, she sank into a comfortable darkness. Comfortable is good, rather than the nightmare of it all. Right, where we were turning back to is okay. This is the forest again. A small white shape lay fallen on the leaves. Ah, we are definitely with Isaiah because it is as he bent down to pick it up. And then Isaiah's name cropped up in a sentence there. I promise I didn't read that far into the sentence. As I felt a strange sharp pain in his chest and his throat tightened uncomfortably. She hadn't dropped it. She'd thrown it tearfully to the ground, turning away as she couldn't bear the sight of it. You're so unfair. Why can't I go there? Why can't I have a friend? You don't love me at all. You only care about yourself, foolish girl, shouting at him so rashly, then running off into the middle of the night. What was she thinking? If she wasn't careful, she could get hurt. She might trip and fall, or run into a wild animal, or get lost out in the woods. He thought he raised her to be smarter than that. What did Cena get up to? Holding the white cat under one arm, Zaya began to swiftly stride after her, his jaw tightly clenched. She'd run off in the direction of the graveyard. Little wonder, considering how it seemed to be her favorite place. But he always disliked it. No matter how many times he visited the cemetery, he could never shake the unpleasant feeling of being watched by someone. Cena! Stop this ridiculous behavior. Don't act like a spoiled, putant child. Although he called out to the darkness in a loud, stern tone, his voice briefly cracked. This was a waste of time for both of them. And if she scraped her knee or twisted an ankle running blindly through the trees, it would be even more of an inconvenience, wouldn't it? She never acted so impulsively before. Perhaps she inherited her mother's carelessness after all. And it was finally beginning to rear its ugly head into in her behavior. Oh dearie me. As he entered the cemetery grounds, his gaze quickly scanned across the sea of graves. There's no sign of Cena, but in the distance he glimpsed something that made his blood run cold. The mausoleum doors, they were open. Had she? Has she fled inside there? I don't think so. His strong claustrophobia had kept him from ever venturing into that place. But from old writings on the manor grounds, he knew that it was a deep, labyrinthy set of catacombs, untouched for many, many years. Running around in its depths without any light or was beyond foolish. What on earth had gotten into that girl? Is this a nightmare similar to one that Essa had in the future? For hell's sake, damn Damn it all! Everything! Although his first instinct was to charge in after her before she could go too far, he forced himself to stop. If he went in blind, then they would both end up lost. He had to go back and fetch a lamp first. He had to follow his mind with all his instincts. Hmm. After a long moment of hesitation, he turned sharply, sharply on his heel and dashed towards the manor. Once he grabbed the first lamp he found inside, Isaiah ran back to the graveyard as fast as he could, panicked adrenaline flooding through his veins. In one hand, he still clutched the soft, small, small soft toy, squeezed it so tightly that his sharp knuckles seemed on the verge of rupturing through his skin. Ugh. Cena. He couldn't let any harm come to her. Foolish, foolish girl. He taught her not to act rationally, rashly, warned her over and over again. Of course she didn't listen to him. She was her mother's daughter, an uncontrollable flame, intent on burning itself out. Why wouldn't she just listen to him? Realize he was protecting her, giving everything just to keep her safe 
the ungrateful little... Ugh. Angry, clenching his teeth, he forced himself through the mausoleum doors. His footsteps echoed off the walls, a sharp but hollow sound and loud, far, far too loud. The lit lamp in his hand only illuminated a few feet in front of him, the remaining darkness blocking him in tightly on every side. Down the crack stairs, dust clogging his lungs, his heart racing at a sickening speed. His mind struck by the image of Cena's terrified face, alone in the dark, wherever she was now. But is she really down there, or is this just a nightmare? Soon he emerged into the decrypt corridor. There was still no sign of Cena, only the long, ominous shapes of caskets buried in the walls and standing along the hallway, like silent sentinels resting in the darkness. Though the ceilings were higher than he expected, he still felt his chest suddenly tighten, forcing his breath to grow shallow. Were well, it air down here would be thin. Cena? Her name emerged from Isaiah's lips as little more than a weak, fearful whisper. As the sound of his own voice sink into his head, a bitter bile swiftly rose to the back of his throat. What a pathetic coward he was, unable to call out for his own daughter petrified by his basest phobia. Phobias are not baseless. They are part of who we are. An uncomfortable, uncontrollable part of who we are. Cena! Cena, can you hear me? When he forced himself to shout, however, instead of carrying any further, his voice seemed to die out within a moment. It was as if something had smothered it, something beyond the underground walls that surrounded him. Even if he were to scream, the sound would surely be suffocated before it could echo any further. But surely in these empty halls it would echo. The unnatural acoustics were only a product of his fear. More importantly, if Cena was here, he had to find her. Quickly. Now. Before she wandered any deeper into the labyrinth. Cobwebs everywhere. And bones there as well on the ground. As you can tell from the near top right. With the lamp in one outstretched hand and Cena's stuffed animal tucked beneath his arm, Isaiah began to wander his way through the corridors. In one of his pockets, he had a withered remnants of several flowers Cena had given him not long ago. Silly as it was, he preferred to keep them on his purse instead of putting them in a vase. Hmm. What is around these parts? Now, however, it was necessary to use them for another purpose. Whenever he was a about to run another corner, he dropped a small colored petal at the edge. Aha! To mark where he was! Exactly! It would be enough to help him find his way back, most likely. And as the air here is very not there, it would um, be a means to escape. See, no, I, I'm not cross with you. Come out, and we're acting as if none of this has ever happened. As he called out for her again, forcing himself to sound calm and dryly patient. His eyes fell on a statue across the hall. He had already passed an unsettling amount of them, but their tall shrouded figures never ceased to disturb him. I'll make a pot of your favourite tea, and we'll read it together by the fire. That's your favourite way to spend a cold night, isn't it? Far better than huddling in the dark, in the cold. The smile that weakly threaded across his lips felt wrong like a coffin opened from the inside. Something that never should have happened. Something that could have been avoided. No, he hadn't done anything wrong. Had he done something wrong? Cena, Cena, please. Another corner, another long, empty corridor that stretched out before him, same as all the others. Was she even here? Should he turn back? But what had he left? Not knowing she was just around the next corner. No, the door was open. She had to be in here. He knew she was. He knew it. Hmm, more bones. Don't treat your father like this. If you want me to apologize, I will. I promise. But don't run away from me. The strength in his voice slowly crumbled, returning to the same trembling whisper as before. Bitter and self-pitying, yet still pleading, clinging to the arrogant faith that he deserved to get his daughter back. But he did, didn't he? 
hadn't he done everything for her, given everything for her, how could she just disappear, leave him, her father, alone and lost, searching in vain, panicking and hopeless? Hmm, more bones. Ah, uh, then he glimpsed it, a disturbance in the dust, the shadow of a footprint. His heart leapt. He had to be hers. Another and another, leaning down the corridor, and another corner, cor and another corner. He had to, he had to follow. Oh no, he ran. The pounding his chest threatened to stop his heart altogether. So intense it overwhelmed him with dizziness and fresh nausea. But she was here, and she was here. He had to find her. They had to escape. Redness, but it wasn't safe. Something about it was wrong. He could feel it, eating away at his head, into his head. Waiting, watching, staring, lurching, moving, following, hunting, closing in, closer and closer and closer. Running in circles, following his own footsteps, faster, closer, finally found. Something in here. What would be in here then? There, around the next corner. They were there. Their faces, uh, their faces. He knew it, he knew it, he knew it. He had to run. It wasn't her. It never was her. It was always them. Run, he had to run, run. But no matter how much he ran, they were always right there. And when he stared at them, their voices entered his head. Voices. Peel off your skin. Drill inside your skull. Drag out your intestines. A pure terrified hatred and rejection of everything of himself. Hmm, he couldn't leave. There was no exit. There were never any petals, never any footprints. Too late. They were crawling in his ears, eating to his head, grinding it all up, living inside him putting him down into a casket shutting the lid. Down, 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 down to the bottom middle of the screen. Rot. Decay. You ended it. Isaiah. Oh, another nightmare. But this time it was Essa. And we were deeper inside the mausoleum this time. Very curious. And is Cena around? A loud choked gasp tore from her throat. She jerked upright, panting and coughing. A sweat dripped off her forehead into her eyes. A dream. No, another nightmare. But she couldn't remember it. Oh, goodness sakes, what on earth had she seen? It was horrible. So horrible, and yet completely vanished from her mind, leaving behind no trace except her frantically racing heartbeat. And to her surprise, the spot beside her on the bed was empty. It was still dark, so why had Cena left? Hmm, why did Cena left? Then, as she started numbly at the white sheets, she realized she could hear something. The soft pattering of rain. She hadn't awoken in the middle of the night. It was just a dark, gloomy morning. Okay, are you sure? Putting herself to the side of her bed, Essa shifted to stand on her feet. I'll check your pocket for you to see if the key is there. And the pain is there. When her legs suddenly started to give way, she managed to grab the bedpost to steady herself just in time. A dull, numbing sensation spread along her spine slowly drained the energy from her surrounding muscles as it traveled further downward. It was painfully familiar, the same reaction she'd felt so many times before, on dark days where she tried to drag herself upright after awakening. But since she'd been staying at a manor, she hasn't experienced it again fully, until today, until last night. Essa drew in a deep, unsteady breath. She could do it. Even while acutely aware of her own weakness, the fiend of being a severed puppet, she could still force herself to move, gingerly, carefully, trying to suppress her fear of falling at any moment. Hmm. 
Move it around the bed's parameter, hold it onto the edge with one hand. As the slowly staggered over to, fo to her folded clothes, sorry. The crippling numbness gradually became less noticeable as she dressed herself, her self-conscious mind adjusting to the nearly dead weight of each limb. Part of her was begging to lie back down to try and sleep off the debilitation, but she wanted to stay awake, to go and greet Stina, to face the day, to make progress with Isaiah's research. Anything, no matter how small, was better than surrendering completely. But where was Stina? I have a little irk that she is somewhere outside. After steadying herself for a few minutes, Essa made her way down the stairs, adjusting to the weight a little more with every step. And... Ah, she could see seeing a small figure seated in the chair before the fire, holding a mug of tea in her hands. Ah, when she noticed Essa, Sina blinked, her eyes drifting away rather suddenly. She took a long sip of her tea before lowering the cup with a faint smile on her lips. It seemed different somehow. Thin. Uncertain. Hmm. Hello, Essa. I woke up early today and couldn't get back to sleep. I've already been doing things around the house for a little bit. Since it's rain, I'm going to clean the parlour and the rooms at the back of the manor. I don't use much, sorry. But you could go ahead and spend the day with Papa's research if you like. I already had breakfast, but I left some for you in the kitchen. Thank you. There was something unusually strained about Cena's voice. As if the casual brightness of her words was forced, an attempted show instead of her normal easy warmth. Hmm. Well then. I'm going to start with one of the old storage rooms, I think. I'll see you later. Hmm. This is definitely strange. And are you actually going to clean those rooms, or are you going to use it as an excuse to try and sneak away and go into the mausoleum out of curiosity? Finishing the rest of her tea in a gulp, she set her, f she set her empty cup on the end table, swiftly rising to her feet. Yes. Thank you for the meal. Ah, that's alright. If you want anything else before dinner, there's plenty in the pantry. Go over for research. After a brief pause, she turned to hurry off towards the stairs, her swift footfalls echoing through the foyer. Her absence left Essa with a twisted knot in her gut, a sudden almost nauseated fear that she'd done something horribly wrong. But how? Cena's been acting perfectly fine the previous night, even curling up tightly against her for comfort. She didn't seem sick or hadn't mentioned the headache, but it seemed unlikely for pain to be the cause of it. Hmm, perhaps she was just in a bad mood. Not everybody could be happy and warm for every moment of their waking lives. Indeed. There was no use in overthinking it now, especially since it was probably nothing. It only unnerved her because of resemblance to her previous dream. That was all. Hmm, that was all. Are you absolutely certain of your own feelings, Essa? Are you sure that you can trust her? After forcing her tightened stomach to eat some of the food Cena prepared for her, Essa returned to Isaiah's study. But as she reached for the door, she noticed it was fully shut. Had she left it that way yesterday? She couldn't remember much, not beyond the dizzy spell that had overtaken her. Very strange. Once she slipped inside of the study, Essa lit a few candles to relieve the, so relieve the gl grey gloom, shivering a little from, her co from the cold. <laughs> Me and words today, the study didn't feel particularly unsettling or eerie to her anymore. Instead, it brought her a strange sense of comfort as a place she could connect with somehow. Picking up the remaining books and papers from the shelf she started yesterday, Essa sat down at Isaiah's desk and pulled over a candle. Despite the heavy lethargy weighing down her body, she was still determined to get through at least a little bit of reading today. Even if her efforts were ultimately fruitless, it was better than doing nothing. It was better than pondering over if that bit of research could provide some fruit. Hmm. As she picked up one of the books, a long rolled up piece of paper stacked beneath it suddenly f fluttered onto her lap. Once she smothered it out across the desk, Essa saw the familiar scribble of Isaiah hand, so Isaiah's handwriting. Through this piece seemed a little neater, more formal. He even titled it, 
a bit haphazardly at the top of the page. Primarily findings on God's spirits. Propping her chin up on one hand, she leaned forward in her chair and began to read. Very curious about all of this. Let's see. Note to Jurium. Kindly read over these pages and tell me, quite honestly, if I sound like a madman. I certainly feel like one. I penned it half in jest, thinking I might turn it into an abstract for the Academy publication. This was further back in time, before remembering that I told the head he was a snivering little bureaucrat with the mental facilities of a mosquito. Still, old habits remain difficult to shake. Old habits die hard. Perhaps you might publish it under your name, if you think any of it may hold water. At the very least, you might make some of the rusty old codger's hearts give out from the mention of anything remotely metaphysical. Preliminary findings on God's spirits. A treatise on the Aphoril and the Pale Cacaxia. Pale Cacaxia? Over the course of several years of research, I discovered a remarkable amount of literature on the, un so on the universal presence of God's spirits, entities lesser known as the Aphoril. In essence, they are a formless energy, one that can travel from the human surroundings into their physical body. What attracts them most is the power of strong emotion, the waves of energy released by feelings of such as despair, frustration, anger, and of course, love. However, when we enter a host, they will begin to consume all of their energy, numbing their bodily strength as well as the intensity of their emotions. Still, as tempting as it remains to simplify and generalize them, the Afro do not appear to be creatures of evil. It seems more accurate to describe them as forces of nature, following a primeval impulse to survive at any cost. They feed off the energy of consciousness itself, leeching from both the impulses of the nervous system and the soul's connection to the universe. The informal title of God's spirits comes from the fact that they are simply too overpowering for the current, hu for, for current human mind, to coexist with them, it would require a divine level of exhaustible strength. As for their existence in the world, for the vast majority of cases, they are completely visible to the eye. Invisible, sorry. From my research, it seems likely that almost every human unknowingly carries at least several of these spirits within them, but displaces their draining effects under different names. Curiously enough, the act of becoming overly conscious of this foreign presence seems to attract further afro to the host. There appears to be no limit to the amount that can infect a body. Indeed, the more they dwell within a person, the more spirits are drawn to them in a slow, steady loop. Loop. Cycle. However, there have been several strange cases of a complete opposite occurring. A pure vessel, Hetero, untouched by the spirit's invasions, can suddenly become highly susceptible to them within a very short time period. Extreme stress and powerful emotion may act like a magnet for the Afro, drawing them in, if present, from the surrounding individuals and environments like an immense vortex. So these are just what you call swirling emotions on a day-to-day -day basis. This may also occur with those already possessed, though it is even less common for those spirits rarely congregate in large numbers. But the most interesting facet of those spirits is a, is a potential connection to a common incurable disease, pale cacaxia, that which is known as the pale cacaxia. If the Avril do in fact exist, their possible relation to the pale is one that cannot be ignored. Indeed, if one connected earlier writings on the god spirits with the instances of those who have recovered from the pale, one could glean the true nature of a possible cure. Hmm. And those same god spirits we could have seen in that nightmare. But of course, they wouldn't whisper die, decay and all that to us if they were god spirits and if they were inherently evil. With that said, the only potential cures one could surmise are disheartening, to say the least. One is virtually impossible, and the other impossibly cruel. Death itself. 
I would discuss these methods in an attempt to learn how they might be potentially achieved, but attempting either of them with our current knowledge of the Admiral would be thoroughly foolish. The core of method is more feasible of the two, but it would require ultimately require continues. Hmm. Lost. Essa Essa quickly turned the paper over, her heart skipping a beat. It was empty. No continuation at all. But in his preface at the top, as I had mentioned multiple pages, the others were close by, then surely Ah, oh, now you're hasting. Scattering her piles of books ac across the desk, she searched through them with intense, increasingly anxious focus. It had to be here somewhere. It had to be. But even after she combed through every book, went through every pile, and even ran back over to the bookshelf to search through it, she found nothing. I can't believe it, she muttered to herself, so stunned and chestfallen that the words came from her without thought. Be half for real. Esther still found it nearly impossible to believe they existed. But if they did, then Isaiah had to be on the right track. Even if he sounded skeptical of the potential cures, they might hint at something she could pursue further. It was without a doubt the very best lead she found so far. Why then did her luck have to suddenly run out like this? Hmm. Damn it. It's here. I know it is. Clenching her jaw, she began to comb her way through the entire row of shells, pulling out every stray of piece of paper she laid eyes on. Gosh, it felt like fate was taunting Esther, dangling the key to her condition in front of her face before hiding it away again. The missing page was simply too much of a cool coincidence. Why, oh why, were these papers the only ones she couldn't find? Eventually, what seemed, after what seemed like hours of fruitless searching, Essa fell back on the dusty bed in defeat. The frustration from such valuable information slipping through her fingers was all but soul-crushing. There was a chance it could still be here, or somewhere else in the house. But a fresh wave of exhaustion crashed down upon her, slipping away any remaining strength she had to go hunting for it. Yikes. Curling up into a little ball, she closed her eyes, listening to the drone of rainfall as the storm carried steadily on. An endless storm was so heavy, it seemed like it might wash everything away. She wished it would. She wished she could wake up to a new morning, to see to see this happy greeting, to a productive day in the garden researching the study. If only sleep could bring something new, something different, something better. Something beyond a brief reply from the everyday burdens, the problems that were always still there when she woke, whenever she woke up. But it never could. Smiling grimly at her own foolish force, she sank into the arms of a long, restless slumber. Long, restless slumber. And possibly into a nightmare. Hmm, a quiet, steady knocking stirred Esther awoke. And it must have been... Seen her? Hours must have passed. A much heavier darkness has replaced the overcast gloom from earlier. Hmm. She slowly swung her legs over the side of her bed, rubbing her blurry eyes with a hand. If anything, the uneasy rest had only made her more tired. Essa? Are you in there? Yes. You can come in, Cena. After a moment, the door slowly creaked open. And Cena is worried about something. Okay, folks. We're going to see what is happening in the next time of Pale Cacexia. I feel like this is coming to some sort of conclusion because we're almost at this point incredibly tempted to go down into the mausoleum to uncover what is actually there. Is a divine voice because those two nightmares were connected in a way. The divine voice that was in a yellow hue and then when further in was replaced with a red hue of the undead. Or it could have been those god spirits which were talked about via Aphoril. But thank you so much for watching, guys. This has been Pale Cacaxia so far. And we shall see the development of this friendship in the next time. It's a little bit crumbling, if I must say so myself. Like from the first nightmare when um, Cena said that Essa was nothing but a nuisance, to now um, looking a little bit concerning. 
Thank you so much for watching and take care of yourselves.